1999 was a pretty big year for me. And the reason why is because 1999 was the year that a very important trilogy was about to come out. Yep, for those of you who are film nerds, you know what I'm talking about. It was the second Star Wars trilogy. You see, as a kid, I grew up watching the first Star Wars trilogy. It really shaped my imagination. I loved sci-fi, I loved fantasy, and here was this incredible series that brought both of those things together. I loved the story of Luke Skywalker and Leia and Han Solo and Chewie. I loved the adventures that they went on. And so when I learned that they were making a prequel trilogy, I could not wait to get in the theaters. And I remember going and seeing The Phantom Menace, really anticipating a day of again watching Jedi and space adventures. And then the movie started to play and I was introduced to Jar Jar Binks. I mean, seriously, who comes up with a character like Jar Jar Binks? I, I remember watching episode one and being like, what is happening to my favorite film series? I mean, the writing wasn't good. The special effects were way over the top. And, and I walked out of episode one being like, oh no, this can't be good. And sure enough, I, I had high hopes for episode two and then that disappointed. And then episode three and it had a great lightsaber fight and that was about it. And, and I just remember getting to the end of that trilogy being like, how is it that this, this trilogy that was just so full of high hopes and high expectations could so tragically let me down? It was part of the reason why I was glad that the Clone Wars animated series came out because it kind of redeemed that storyline for me. And then 2015 came around and I was told they're making another Star Wars trilogy and, and I was kind of cautiously optimistic. I mean, again, I ended up reading all these like Star Wars books about what stories and adventures Luke Skywalker and his friends went on after Return of the Jedi. And I was like, surely if they even borrow just a little bit from these storylines, this trilogy is gonna be awesome. And it was terrible. In fact, it was so bad that we pretend that it doesn't even exist in my household. I will not let my kids watch any of those movies because I don't want it to ruin the, the, the magic of the original Star Wars trilogy. Now you might be sitting there being just like, man, Nick, you are a, you're a huge Star Wars nerd. And you'd be correct. I am a huge Star Wars nerd, but you're probably wondering why I'm sharing this. Well, because I think this is what often happens with high expectations, right? We're looking forward to something and then it actually comes along and it's not quite what we'd hoped for. And what's true of film is also true of life because we often have high expectations for our lives, right? We have high expectations for that new job or career, for that new move, that new relationship, but then life happens and it doesn't quite live up to our expectations. Even in those moments where we get what we thought we always wanted, when it finally arrives, we're just kind of like, it doesn't quite satisfy the way that I thought. And the question is, why is that? How is it that I can make the most of the rest of my life? That's a question that I think we all wrestle with at some point. And that's part of the reason why we're doing this series called How to Inhabit Time, in which we're looking at a particular book in the Bible that addresses this very dilemma. It's the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Ecclesiastes, you might be like, oh no, because Ecclesiastes at times can be a hard book to read. Others of you didn't even know that there was a book called Ecclesiastes, and you're like, why of all places would we be studying this? Well, the reason why is because Ecclesiastes cuts to the heart of why we struggle with such great expectations. And as we dive into this book this weekend, what I think we need to understand about Ecclesiastes is that it introduces us to two key themes, presents us with one central challenge, and ultimately points us toward a hope that truly is from everlasting to everlasting. So if you have your Bibles, or maybe you picked up an Ecclesiastes scripture journal, I would invite you to open up with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Now, I want to set up the book for just a moment. Ecclesiastes is what is known as wisdom literature. It is a genre designed to help us meditate and reflect on life as it is lived. The books that fall into wisdom literature are Proverbs and Job and, yes, Ecclesiastes. But it's also important to understand a little something about the author. Now, if you're raised in church, you may have been told that the author is King Solomon. 
And part of the reason why is because of how the book opens. We read these words in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 1, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Likewise, a little bit later on, the teacher or the preacher says this. He said, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. Many people read this and they say, this sounds like a description of Solomon because Solomon was king in Jerusalem. He was known as being the wisest of Israel's kings. He was a man who was known for searching out wisdom and having great success. But here's something that's worth noting. This preacher, this teacher, isn't actually the author of the book. The author of the book actually doesn't reveal himself until the very last verses in chapter 12, where the author finally steps out from behind the curtain and talks about the preacher or the teacher in the third person. Furthermore, many people have noted that some of the things that the, that the preacher says about himself don't quite match up with Solomon's own biography. Here's what I mean. Look a little bit later on with me in chapter 1 for just a moment. He said in verse 16, I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. Now, those of you who know your Bible trivia know that the only other king who had been king in Jerusalem was, that's right, Solomon's dad, David. There weren't really any other kings ruling in Jerusalem before them. And so many have noted that it seems kind of odd to say that. You see, really, the preacher is anonymous. He's actually a character. He's a character who's meant to help us run a kind of thought experiment. What the author of Ecclesiastes is doing is he's basically creating this archetype, this archetype of a Solomon-like figure, a, a king who is wise, who's one of the wisest and most successful people in the land, in order to take us on a, an honest examination of all the complexities of life. This person is, is created to help us really start to think about what if you had all wisdom? If you had everything that you could possibly desire in life, would that ultimately satisfy you? And so the author of Ecclesiastes is inviting us to walk with the preacher on this thought experiment. And the preacher introduces us to two key themes. Find the first theme in chapter 1, verse 2, where the preacher says this, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now, we need to stop right here because this word that is translated in the English Standard Version, vanity, is translated differently in some other translations. Sometimes it's translated meaningless. And the reality is, is the reason why all these different translations translate this word differently is because it's actually a very difficult idea to translate into English. The Hebrew word is hevel, and hevel really means smoke or vapor. Now, you would say that's not really hard to translate. Why doesn't he just call it smoke or, or vapor? Well, because it's not so much translating the word, it's understanding how the preacher is using this idea, using this concept. You see, this word hevel shows up 40 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. And I think the reason why the preacher uses this term is because he's trying to help us understand something fundamental about life. He says all of life is like vapor or smoke or mist. You know, when you see smoke, is the smoke really there? Well, yeah, it is. But if you try to reach out and grasp it, what happens? It's intangible. If you look for patterns in the clouds or in the smoke and you think you finally see a picture emerge, suddenly it changes and is blown away. It disappears and dissipates. One of my favorite Old Testament scholars says it's almost like a mirage, right? He's saying life is like a mirage. Just when you think you have it figured out, just when it seems to kind of take some sort of shape or definition, it changes. When you try to finally get a hold of it or grasp it, it just slips through your fingers. See, this key idea is, is fundamental to understanding what the preacher is talking about. He says, when you really look at, at life, what you see is it's constantly shifting and changing. Just when you finally think you've got it all figured out, something happens and it just seems to slip through your fingers. 
So the first key theme we have to understand is he's saying life is an unsearchable mirage. Try as you might to understand it, you never will, at least not on the basis of merely human wisdom. The second key theme that the preacher introduces us to is this idea of life under the sun. Here's what we read. He says, what does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? You see, this phrase, under the sun, is another really key theme in Ecclesiastes. It appears over 30 times in just 12 chapters. And what he's referring to when he talks about life under the sun is, well, he's referring to the slow, steady march of time. And I know you're looking at this and you're wondering, oh gosh, is that how much time Nick has left in this sermon? No, but hopefully you get the idea. When he talks about life under the sun, he's talking about the fact that ages come and ages go and nothing really seems to change. And listen to some of the things that the preacher says just here in chapter 1. He says, A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, where they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. See, he says, we live in a world where we're subject to the slow, steady, relentless passage of time. Life seems to go on seemingly uncaring about our petty advancements or our temporary plans. He says, one generation goes and uh, another comes, and, and we don't really remember the former things. And if you really think about it, there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, how many of us can actually state the full name of our great-great-grandpa? I mean, really think about it for a moment, right? Truly, one generation goes and another comes, and we don't remember the former things. We may point to our technological advancements and say, well, surely there's new things. I mean, there's new technology, but really, all of our technology is simply an advancement that helps us continue to do the same old things. I mean, think about our military advances for just a moment, right? What is a, a guided missile, if not just a better form of a catapult, which is really just an improvement on a sling, which is really just another way for us to throw rocks at each other? Truly, nothing changes. We may make these little advancements, but life goes on seemingly uncaring in the passage of time. See, what he's telling us is that for all of our striving, time wipes it all away. The rules that we live by, the monuments that we build, the things that we take pleasure in, under the sun, they are nothing but mist and shadows. Essentially, if this is all there is, then the writer of Ecclesiastes says, yeah, it all seems pretty meaningless. It's just a bunch of hevel. It's all slipping through our fingers and fading away. These are the two key themes that the author of Ecclesiastes is going to return to over and over and over again. And all of it is intended to bring us face to face with one central challenge. Now, I really like how the uh, writer, Old Testament writer Christopher Wright uh, talks about this. He says Ecclesiastes is a very unsettling book because of the challenge it presents. Here's what he writes. He says, The most challenging difference between wisdom and the rest of the Old Testament arises when some voices within the former express doubts about or question the universal applicability of some of the mainline affirmations in other parts of the Old Testament. And yet this may be precisely part of the purpose of the presence of this material in the canon of Scripture, to compel us toward an honest faith that is willing to acknowledge the existence of doubts we cannot entirely dismiss and questions we cannot satisfactorily answer within the limits of our experience or even the limits of the revelation God has chosen to give us. You see, the author of Ecclesiastes is actually in dialogue with other parts of the Bible, Proverbs in particular. Here's what I mean. 
we tend to look at the book of Proverbs as a book of promises. Like, for example, we'll read Proverbs chapter 13, 9, which says, the light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked is snuffed out. And we say, yeah, that's it. That's the way life is supposed to work. And yeah, sometimes life works that way. But then along comes the author of Ecclesiastes who writes, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there is wickedness. So what's going on here? Well, the author of Ecclesiastes is encouraging us to remember that proverbs are proverbs. They're not promises. They're general principles about, yeah, life does work this way sometimes. But the author of Ecclesiastes comes along and says, but not always. There are times when the wicked seem to prosper and it is the righteous whose lamp is snuffed out. And this is really what the author of Ecclesiastes is getting at. He says, we have this sense that life should work a certain way, but it doesn't. In fact, it's often unsearchable, that time marches on with seemingly little purpose. That's the challenge that he puts before us. I love how Tim Mackey, one of the co-founders of the Bible Project, puts it. He calls this the myth of religious fulfillment. And the myth goes a little something like this. I invite God into my life so that my life will go better. We think, you know, if I have God in my life, then I'm going to be protected from hardships. I'm going to be protected from disappointments. He's going to come along and, and things will improve for me. But that's not the way it always works. That's what the author of Ecclesiastes is getting at is maybe that's the wrong kind of expectation. And I'm sure that there are some of us who are listening to this message saying, boy, I'm glad so-and-so is here. He really needs to hear this. But the author of Ecclesiastes doesn't let us get away with that. He really needs us to understand that we all tend to do this. Ecclesiastes is 12 chapters of peeling that argument back layer by layer, forcing us to come face to face with the fact that we all do this. We all tend to do, delude ourselves by having expectations that God would come and bless our plans, bless our lives, and yet we rarely think about them. We assume that God is up to something in our lives, at least we hope he is, but then we're very aware that he's not ac operating according to our expectations when suddenly life doesn't go the way that we expect, when it gets hard, when it gets difficult. We know that we have expectations of God when he doesn't meet those expectations. When we become angry or upset with God and maybe we give up on following God altogether. The author of Ecclesiastes says you need to wrestle with those great expectations. You need to wrestle with this myth of religious fulfillment to see that it doesn't actually satisfy. Ecclesiastes is a book that is intended to drive us to our knees, to bring us to a place where we finally are ready to give up on the myth of religious fulfillment in order to make space for something better in order to make space for a hope that goes beyond the hevel. You see, this really comes to the forefront when you finally get to the end of the book, when the true author of Ecclesiastes steps out from behind the curtain and helps us to really understand what he's doing. You see, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 9 to 14, the author writes this, The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. The author of Ecclesiastes tells us, everything that you've heard the preacher say is a goad. See, what a goad is, is it's something that a shepherd uses to get the sheep moving. What the author of Ecclesiastes is saying is like, look, if, if truly all that there is is life under the sun, then yeah, it all seems pretty meaningless. But what I want you to understand is that that isn't all that there is. I want you to give up on that search to make space for something better. There, this is a goad to get you to go on a journey that otherwise you wouldn't take. Love how the theologian Robert Short puts it. He says, Ecclesiastes is essentially a kind of negative theologian. He's asking questions that can be answered only by a future revelation of God. And clearing the road for this revelation, he smashes any and all false hopes to pieces. Ecclesiastes is the Bible's night before Christmas. 
Ecclesiastes is human self-sufficiency stretched to its absolute limit and found sadly wanting. See, the author of Ecclesiastes says this book is a starting point. It is a beginning. It's a beginning of a journey that you have to take if you truly want to understand what matters most. It's a journey that you have to take with your shepherd. Because he goes on and writes this. He says, The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. He says, look, there is something more than just simply life under the sun. There's a life walking with your shepherd, with your God. And it's only as you walk with him that you will understand why we're here. He says, the myth of religious fulfillment will not satisfy in a world of hevel under the sun. We need to learn that we have a God who makes better promises. Not promises to bless our agenda and our plans, but rather a God who promises in a way that is revealed later in Scripture to enter the hevel of human existence and to take it all onto his own shoulders on the cross. That we ultimately have a God who enters into the hevel of life under the sun and bears the burdens that we can't bear and provides the meaning that we can't seem to grasp. A God who enters into relationship with us as our good shepherd, the shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep, ultimately Jesus himself. We have a God who interrupts the meaninglessness of existence, who steps into the brokenness and pierces the smoky darkness to offer us a way forward in Christ. Ecclesiastes is a beginning. It's a starting point. It beckons us to take a better road, a road less traveled, but one that leads to true life. And the question is, will you come along on the journey? Let's pray. Lord God, we give you thanks that you are a God who does bring us face to face with the fact that if all we're looking for is satisfaction under the sun, we won't find it here. And while initially that may seem like bad news, really it ultimately makes space for the best news. It brings us face to face with the fact that too often we settle for things that are far too small. And that we have a God who invites us into a much bigger story, a story much bigger than the, one that's, the ones that we would create for ourselves or settle for. And so Lord, our prayer at the start of this series is that we would be willing to take the journey, hard and challenging though it may be, to ultimately see that you, Lord, are the one who satisfies the deepest longings of our hearts, and that it's as we follow you that we will truly learn what it means to inhabit time well, to make the most of our days, and to set our hopes on an eternity which only you can give. It's in your name, Lord Jesus, that we pray. Amen. <music>